Hi everyone. What wastes billions of dollars, infamously appears in the news constantly, and contradicts America's core values? Uh, Kim Kardashian. Nope, not Kim Kardashian. Ah, damn it. The answer is America's criminal justice system. Oh, well, that's not nearly as entertaining. In our age of mass incarceration, harsh penalties, and insane recidivism rates, sometimes it's easy to forget where our problems begin. With you guys, our youth. <laughs> That's the way to get your audience on your side. <laughs> you're at fault. Let me continue to tell you how much you're at fault. Our juvenile justice system criminalizes young people, beginning their future in and out of prisons. Argument number one. The system criminalizes young people. The system does this. This is a story about Rachel, a young woman who I met at a fundraising breakfast where we learned about social justice issues and I also ate about 12 pancakes. That was a poorly delivered joke. I'll let you take bets on whether or not anyone in the audience laughed at it. Ready to find out? Here we go. Um, Rachel shared with us her story when she's at the young age of 11. Her family couldn't afford to buy her the new pair of clothes she needed, so she wound up shoplifting the clothes. You make it sound as though Rachel just accidentally ended up becoming a thief. I thought the system criminalized the youth. She was caught almost immediately by the security guard, and he did not just send her off with a warning. Are you implying that he was under some moral obligation to do so? Because he's not. Instead, he called the police and she was brought into custody. At her hearing, the judge sentenced her to three months in a juvenile hall. I'll concede that three months is a pretty stiff sentence for an 11-year-old, but you also conveniently failed to mention how much in goods she stole. Regardless, one would hope that such an experience would de-incentivize her from ever stealing again, which is the entire point. Imagine being a fourth grader, a preteen, wearing the same pair of clothes every day, living with strangers, away from your parents and your family, and having to use the restroom in your cell, and having your whole life dictated by administrators. Imagine fights breaking out between children and guards, people constantly yelling. Incarceration is not a day spa. It is a disincentive from committing crimes in the future. Rachel told us she felt like nobody cared about her in there. She underwent a traumatic and indelible experience, one she will never forget. Well, hopefully then those three months did their work and Rachel will never commit any more crimes. Our juvenile justice system allowed an 11 year old girl to be locked away, leaving her with a criminal record that will follow Rachel her whole life. Absolute nonsense. Most states provide for the sealing of juvenile records, essentially wiping them off the books. You just have to meet the requirements for such and submit the appropriate paperwork, depending on the jurisdiction. After sealing, you can legally state on job applications and the like that you have not been convicted of a crime. Generally, if children like Rachel do not receive strong support, they'll continue to make mistakes that will eventually land them inside a prison. Where were Rachel's parents during all of this? I understand they couldn't afford to buy her the clothes that she decided to steal, but don't they have a role in providing support to their daughter? This is where the journey to incarceration starts for many of our nation's youth. People refer to this concept as the school to prison pipeline. In short, this pipeline refers from kids going straight from school to jail. But Rachel went straight from stealing to jail. Nothing in the story involved school. There are many reasons for this pipeline. One emerging pattern is failing public schools pushing students out of our education system instead of fostering learning. Rachel was 11 years old when she decided to steal. She was in the fourth grade and wasn't anywhere near being quote unquote pushed out by a faulty education system. And to reiterate, where are the parents in this equation of fostering learning? According to a New York Times article, 
a student who drops out of high school is 47 times more likely to become incarcerated than a college graduate. Dropping out of high school is a choice. Stealing things is a choice. Rachel didn't drop out of high school. She stole when she was in the fourth grade. You are failing at making a point here. So your parents are right, school does matter. Do your homework. This is the first true thing you have said thus far. <laughs> the ACLU lists several other factors contributing to the school to prison pipeline. Uh, one pattern is zero tolerance discipline strategies, policies that will automatically impose harsh penalties, sometimes regardless of what actually happened. Under these policies, students are suspended or expelled at higher rates for more trivial actions. What better way to kick someone out of our education system than to actually kick them out of school with an expulsion? Yes, well, that's what the word expulsion means in the context of a school, but putting that aside, yes, I will agree that depending on the situation, having a zero tolerance standard can inordinately punish a student regardless of the facts of the case. However, you have to consider the increasing degree of liability applied to administrators and school districts and the increased litigiousness of parents and others over anything that might be perceived as a failure of staff to protect their children. While zero tolerance policies might be undesirable, they are not being implemented in a vacuum. Stationing police officers in schools is another quick way to criminalize our places of education. Students are being arrested more and more inside our schools for nonviolent offenses. Going to provide us any kind of statistics or studies to back up that claim? No? Okay, then I dismiss it. And finally, the increasing rates of juvenile detention helps to fuel the school to prison pipeline. Well, what would you propose for kids who commit crimes? That we just let them off without any punishment? How do you propose to try to disincentivize them from committing crimes as adults? I, I don't understand what your solution to this problem is. And you haven't shown anything that says that it is the school's responsibility to groom children to not be criminals. Where are you going with this? Children in detention facilities, just like Rachel, receive fewer educational, ooh, sorry, educational resources inside the facilities and struggle coming back to school. Many do not graduate from high school. This is another point that I would tend to agree with you on. There should be some reasonable education and tutoring mechanisms in place to supplement for juveniles what they are being deprived of during their detention. Slicing away months of learning time can and does have a stunting effect on a child's ability to retain and apply what they learn in school. And these factors affect students of color at much higher rates than their white peers. Because racism? Noting especially that a black student is 3.5 times more likely to be suspended than a white student. Because racism? That 70% of in-school arrests are of students of color. Because racism? And that students of color are 2.7 times more likely to wind up in juvenile incarceration than a white student. Because racism? I mean, are you even going to attempt to provide an explanation for this or just throw out the numbers? No, you're just going to leave it blank and assume the God of the gaps theory, thus racism. Right. So for these reasons and others, prison becomes the future for many of our nation's youth. Instead of obtaining higher education, pursuing their dream career, or starting a family. Yes, if you decide to engage in a life of crime, and drop out of high school, and continue committing crimes, you are going to be significantly hampered from proceeding through life with ease. How can we fix our broken system with a new approach to justice? Okay, so we're done with the foreplay. Let's get down to the meat of the matter. I'm going to share with you a concept called restorative justice. Restorative justice, a system of criminal justice that focuses on the rehabilitation of offenders through reconciliation with victims and the community at large. I knew I had heard this phrase before because my mind went immediately to the truth and reconciliation process that took place in South Africa in the 90s to try to come to terms with the crimes of apartheid. 
but we'll get more into the results of that process as we continue. Restorative justice is an approach to education that allows children to trust and respect the discipline process while also eliminating harsh and ineffective punishments, thus contributing to a safer school climate and a reduction in juvenile incarceration. Ladies and gentlemen, I have here the most effective cure for all ailments, rheumatism, rubella, warts, wrinkles, hair that will not cooperate. Let's say there's a boy named Sean and he's 13 years old, that's gonna be me, and Sean gets really angry and he punches someone. That little bastard, why I oughta- Have any of you guys ever acted out of anger and done something that you regret? Would you believe anyone who answered that question with a no? Do you think that it is fair for our entire lives to be judged based on one mistake we made when we were 13 years old? It would depend entirely on the severity of the mistake, wouldn't it? Imagine with me a justice system that would not suspend or expel Sean for his rash action. Instead, restorative justice would bring together everybody in the case to analyze the whole situation to restore and repair relationships. We would hold a circle between the victim, the offender, family members, teachers, and peers to determine how we can best bring healing to the situation. Here are some of the criticisms of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission from South Africa. A 1998 study by South Africa's Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation and the Kulumani Support Group, which surveyed several hundred victims of human rights abuse during the apartheid era, found that most felt the TRC had failed to achieve reconciliation between the black and white communities. Most believed that justice was a prerequisite to reconciliation rather than an alternative to it and that the TRC had been weighted in favor of the perpetrators of abuse. Among the highest profile of these objections were the criticisms leveled by the family of prominent anti-apartheid activist Steve Biko, who was killed by the security police and whose story was featured in the film Cry Freedom. Biko's family described the TRC as a vehicle for political expediency, which robbed them of their right to justice. The family opposed amnesty for his killers on these grounds and brought a legal action in South Africa's highest court arguing that the TRC was unconstitutional. The idea of restorative justice, essentially bringing the two parties together to shake hands and make up, might work on low-level schoolyard disputes. But if you mean to apply it as a replacement for legal consequences to the commission of real crimes, well, we have an entire nation's experiences with that theory to draw from. You might benefit from paying attention to them. Instead, this comprehensive justice system would impose consequences to make sure Rachel knew not to steal again, but would also make sure she was receiving enough resources at home. I understand I am in broken record territory here, but I will ask again. Where are Rachel's parents in this scenario? Is it your contention that the state should take up the responsibility from the parents to raise Rachel not to be a high school dropout and a career criminal? Believe it or not, I'm not coming up with a crazy, out of the blue, unreasonable idea like I normally would. Well, that's a wonderfully self-destructive statement against your credibility. Many school districts have been practicing restorative justice and are seeing amazing results. In particular, local Okun Unified School District, or OUSD, has done a fantastic job with its restorative justice program, also known as RJ. Uh, from 2011 to 2014, this local school district has implemented restorative justice sites in 30 of its schools. Graduation rates at RJ sites were 53% higher than non-RJ sites. Chronic absence went down 24% at RJ sites. Dropout rates went down 56% at RJ sites. These stats prove that restorative justice is ending some of the effects from the zero tolerance discipline, police discipline, and court involvement that I was talking about earlier. Correlation does not equal causation. I would have hoped your schooling had taught you that by now. Rachel put it this way, restorative justice is the opposite of criminal justice because it is justice that heals rather than criminalizes. You have provided no substantive proof of any of this and are pitching a panacea for all of society's ills. Come back to me after you've completed college and lived a little bit more life. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching.